So what I want to talk about today, we'll get into in a little more detail, but the idea of scalability with ACA. ACA's promise, of course, the thing that the brochure reads and the thing on the outside of the box says, you're going to get this amazing scalability and elasticity and so on. How do you do that? So it's not so much about the tool, it's about the patterns with which you apply the tool. Like anything, knowing the tool isn't enough. So who am I, for starters, and why should I be talking about this? So I work for Bold Radius Solutions. I'm Michael Nash. I'm our VP Capabilities. Um, we're a type safe partner. We do a lot of enablement to many different companies and organizations all over the US, a little bit into Europe. And uh, there's my Twitter handle and email. That's who I am. So what? What are you going to know 45 minutes from now or ish that you didn't know when you started? I want to talk a little bit about what I call distributed domain driven design. Domain driven design you may have heard the term of, but maybe not with the distributed prefix. This is a technique that I'm going to describe that I believe in many situations allow you, allows you to achieve a level of scalability that is very hard to do in other ways. What is it? How does it apply to a project, of course? We're also going to talk about some three-letter acronyms. Uh, well, OK, a four-letter acronym as well. CQRS and, OK, a two-letter acronym. And event sourcing. Um, and we're going to talk about how to do all of this with ACA. And what, how does a project done this way differ from a project done the quotes, normal way. What's the difference? So first, let me set some terms. Scalability, it's an interesting term. It is not directly performance. It's not even necessarily directly related to performance. Performance is increasing. A performance going up means your response time goes down. So you get the same answer in a shorter period of time. That's directly measuring performance. Scalability is more about improving your capacity to handle more requests over the same period of time by adding resources. So if your performance goes up, your scalability will go up a little, but your ability to scale beyond a certain limit is actually the innate scalability metric that I want to talk about. We'll talk about the difference between those two. So scalability, I'm sure you've heard the term scaling up a bigger box, you know, put it on a mainframe, great, we scale up, or we scale out. ACA gives you the ability to do both. It shouldn't be ignored that it, we can go in both of those dimensions, but is usually talked about in the context of scaling out. More boxes, e.g. a cluster. Oops, wrong button. So I keep using this word ACA. Let's make sure we know what it means. ACA is basically an implementation of something called the actor model, which has been around long before ACA, implemented for the JVM. <clears throat> in a mouthful, it's a share nothing distributed message driven compute model. Now, there's a lot of fancy terms in there, but you'll see how that interoperates as we go down the, the presentation. There is a Scala and a Java API for it. And it's a little bit like if you've ever heard of or seen a presentation about Erlang or Elixir, which is a new language on the Erlang VM. It's a little bit like what they call processes or processes, if I pronounce it correctly, in the Erlang and Elixir world, only I think better. It is what they call distributed by design. That is, it is meant to work in a network of interconnected machines. It is intended to allow you to get past the von Neumann architecture. Using ACA in a local environment and within one system is actually an optimization. So it's, you don't change your, your model or how you build applications. It's strictly an optimization because you don't need to serialize. You don't need to send things over a network. So let's also define these terms, CQRS and ES. So command query responsibility segregation, sometimes also said as separation, is basically a lot of mouthful of words there, but really what we're saying is take the read side and the write side of your problem and think about them separately. That's CQRS in a nutshell. And they can be optimized differently. Usually they're at different levels of scale. You don't necessarily write as often as you read, but the kind of problem that this sort of domain-driven design, distributed domain-driven design applies well to are problems where you are both reading and writing. So CQRS is often discussed in this context. There's also a concept which is quite separate called event sourcing. That is where state, let's say a bank balance, is derived by processing a series of events, things that have happened in the past and are done, to derive that state. In other words, you don't save the bank balance of $20. You say, I added $10, I added $10, now I have $20. Those two are the events. That's really all event sourcing is. One does not need the other. CQRS and ES are often seen in combination. They are not necessarily techniques that require each other. You could do CQRS without ES, you could do ES without CQRS. 
So let's look at event sourcing a little bit more closely first. Event sourcing, as I said, is producing state, so producing some value, some current amount, some current state, some name, some object state, from a series of events. Now events are differentiated from commands, they are both messages, in the sense that an event happened in the past. There's no such thing as rejecting an event, an event is already done. A command is a request to do something in the future, and might result in an event, but an event is in the past. So we have this series of events, which are stored in what we call a journal. And again, some of the terminology will change when some people talk about event sourcing, but essentially these are the basics. We have these series of events stored in a journal. We read that journal in order to produce a domain instance to have some state, say our bank balance, or in this case, our current state of an auction, when I get to my example app in a few minutes. Everybody with me so far? Yeah, blank stairs? Couple of nods? Okay, it's a good sign. So CQRS, and I'm explaining all of these terms because I'm going to use them all together to describe this architecture in a few minutes. CQRS, Command Query Respons Responsibility Separation. We're saying that the write side is separated from the read side and scaled independently. What I mean by that is that the write side consists of a series of commands, in this case things that I'm asking you to do in the future, writes, change your state, change your state to this, deposit $10. A command may or may not succeed when it's actually processed, whereas an event is something in the past. Those are sent to a write model, which may, if it's integrated in the idea of event sourcing, then produce a series of events, saying all of the commands which I was able to process, which were valid, are now producing events which are now in the past. That's the read side of my model. So that's how this, the read side and the write side may cooperate. I say may because there are many different ways of making that communication. In this case, I'm using this way. And for my example, I'm using this way. OK, let's, a couple more terms, and then I promise we'll get to some actual code. So I've banded around the term domain a little bit. Domain is the part of your application that relates to the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're writing a payroll app, then your domain would include things like employees, pay stubs, paychecks, pay runs, let's say. Uh, it would not necessarily include things like database connection. Database connection is plumbing. So that's a differentiation I'll make, infrastructure from domain. So when I say domain-driven design, that is a design and an architecture of your application that is based around the things in the problem you're trying to solve and the verbs that operate on those things in this context, in what's called a ubiquitous language or a domain, which are all of the things in the pool of the problem we're trying to solve. It is not only for object-oriented systems. This is a common misconception that DDD is a technique from a few years ago that is only applicable to object-oriented. It doesn't really apply to object-functional languages such as Scala. I don't find that true at all. I find DDD works perfectly well in, uh, in Scala. It is also not an either-or choice in the sense that object-oriented versus functional presupposes that those two are in competition. I don't think they are either, certainly not in the Scala world. So I'm preaching to the converted a little bit here, so I'll move on. A distributed domain-driven design is a natural fit with the actor model, is the real premise of my conversation here. So let me talk about what I mean by a domain instance. A domain instance is a thing like, let's say, a customer. We have a customer. And a single instance of that object is a domain instance. So let's say that we want to read and write to that customer in a traditional application, traditional web application. We're probably going to read that thing into memory out of a database, let's say, populate the object, do some operations to it, and then perhaps discard it, garbage collect it, go on, create another instance somewhere else of perhaps that same customer. That's a traditional way of doing domain-driven design and having what I'm going to call transient domain instances. So that's a non-distributed domain which is your basic CRUD operations, right? Create, read, update, delete. We've all, we're all familiar with these, I imagine. Reads and writes are to the same backend data store. I'll say data store rather than database, but often that's a, let's say, a relational database or an object database, same idea. It's always consistent. The good news is that it's always consistent because your arbiter of consistency is that data store. So I don't take a customer record that I had over here five minutes ago and utilize it. I reread the state from the database. Therefore, I know I have the current value of all of the fields for that customer, even if they got updated by some other node somewhere else. The way you scale this model is through homogeneous replication. In other words, you take that one instance and you copy it lots of times on lots of different machines. There is a problem with this model in the sense that 
let's say we load balance across all of those instances with HTTP. Say we've got a front-end JavaScript application or some application that is uh, a client over HTTP that's using REST to talk to our back-end service. We're doing load balancing across all of these identical instances. We're still going to bottleneck for contention on that back-end database, even if the back-end database is distributed. Because if I need to talk about customer five and I need to do it on two separate nodes, I have to wait for one operation on customer five before I can read customer five with consistency. So when we scale the traditional model, as I said, we add multiple servers and we replicate the entire application, let's say, across all of these multiple servers. We must read that state every time. We must write fully. In other words, we can't say, start the write, now I'm going to go do something else. We have to write and then say, yes, OK, the write is complete to the same shared database resource, whether that's an actual database, a file, comes out the same. Even an in-memory cache turns out to be exactly the same problem. And scalability eventually has a ceiling in the sense that if we add enough instances, contention will start to fight with us. So the traditional model looks a little bit like this. A load balancer, like we were talking about, a number of HTTP service services that are actually providing the service out to whatever the client is, maybe a cache for a read speed on the side. Um, and then these transient domain instances. So we pull up this customer, we do something with it, we throw it away. And that's where our business logic resides. And then we have the one logical data store behind us, which again, could be distributed across multiple systems, but it is still a single logical store. So what's different? What am I proposing could be a different way of doing this? Well, with ACA and distributed domain-driven design, wouldn't it be great if you could just keep all your domain instances in memory? Sounds like a bit of a pipe dream. Sounds kind of dangerous. Uh, how to recover from the volatile nature, right? The lights go out, poof, domain instance is gone. You know, it's always, it, it's always a thousand times faster to keep stuff in memory. That's great. But volatile and also now how do we share amongst instances? Well, that's what we're trying to answer. So imagine a model a little bit like this, where we have our HTTP API, let's say, and then we have ACA's cluster sharding capability, which I'll let you read about on your own. It basically allows us to route messages to appropriate nodes within an ACA cluster, all of which are aware of each other, based on some value, some key, some shard key, as we're going to call it. Let's say it's the customer ID in this case. And we have a hash function that says every time I hash the customer ID to this hash function, it results in a cluster identifier. So one of these clusters can actually manage one of these shards, I should say, let me use the right term. One of these shards can manage entries for customer one, a different shard can manage entries for customer five, and so on. What does that give us? What would that buy us? Let's say we only had 15 customer instances. So let's look at it in the miniature. If we had 15 customer instances, we could slice them up and say five on each of these three nodes. Now, if I get a request for customer seven, my hash function will automatically route that to node two. Great exists as a cluster singleton within my entire system, so customer two is always on that one group of machines. Because although here I show a single node, cluster sharding typically is set up such that that would actually be two or three nodes, maybe more. Each of those nodes now can maintain a journal. Here comes the event sourcing that we were talking about earlier. Each of those nodes can maintain a journal of all of the state changes for the instances that are resident in that shard, but not in any other. So in other words, the journal underneath, the journal here, would have all deltas for customer seven, but no deltas for customer 12. With me so far? But I have too many instances, right? Great, we try to load this all into memory. That, that isn't going to work. I obviously, I hope, have more than 15 customers. Let's say I have 15 million customers. OK, all I actually need in memory for operations are the active instances of customers. So I can still use my cluster sharding, but I can say that the individual actor, which in this case is going to represent my domain instance, is activated and passivated as necessary. The as necessary kind of looks a little bit like this if you flow chart it out. So in other words, if I'm sending a message to customer 12, I know which cluster group that's what shard that's going to go to. So one of these five nodes should have customer 12. None of them do? OK, start up an actor for customer 12, read the event journal. Now I have an actor in memory that has the current state of customer 12. Send that the message. Now, customer 12 hangs around for a little while. A timer message comes along that says, customer 12, you've been sitting in memory not with no activity for whatever my timeout value is, 30 seconds, passivate. I take myself out of memory. 
This is basic virtual memory, pagination. Right? We've done it in many applications over many years. If you apply it to the actor model, it allows you to say, I only want to actually have in memory all of my active instances, not all of my instances. This is how you fit 15 million customers in memory. Or you get more servers, which is an option. So what are the ingredients? So if I were to put together a system like this, what would it look like? And I'm getting to the point where I'm actually going to show you some code and show you a GitHub repo that says, here's an example, because we worked out an example independent of any of our clients after we'd done this three or four times for clients and went, hmm, we need a pattern for this. So we're going to use Akka with its Scala API. It's entirely possible to use Akka from Java. In this particular example, we're going to use it from, Sc uh, from Scala. We're going to use the Cassandra database, which is a very high performance uh, object database. And specifically, it's very high performance in writes. Um, and we're going to build this application both using the traditional model and build it using distributed domain-driven design, then put it under load test and see what the difference is. And we're going to use TypeSafe Activator for our template. So we've published a template that lets you start with exactly what I'm going to show you. So what's different between these two versions of this application? Let's summarize. Our domain object instances in the, in the model we're going to build are transient and memory resident when in use. Reads and writes don't contend for resources because reads and writes are being separated by the CQRS paradigm. And the cluster can be grown until the domain instances per node equals one. What I mean by that is you should get benefit until you get to the point where the number of customers, let's say, in this case auctions is actually what we're going to do in our pattern, but in the example I was using before customers, until that customer is alone on one server. That's the point at which your scalability will stop and you won't get any benefit by adding additional machines because you're not thinning the processing across multiple machines anymore. Follow why that would be? Okay, let's look at what that was. What, what does that buy us? So what does it get us? What are we actually trying to achieve? What we're trying to achieve is scalability. Not just performance, but scalability. We're saying we want to be able to add more nodes and have that immediately result in a higher capacity without having to change anything about the logic of our application, other than maybe a little bit of configuration to say, hey, you've got more nodes. And in ACA cluster, that's actually not much config at all. We want failover, however. We don't want any single point of failure or single point of contention. We want instances that can be created anywhere as needed, so that customer can be spun up on a node in the correct uh, shard of the cluster, but not necessarily the same node every time. It could be any of the nodes in that shard. And we want simplicity. This all sounds very complicated, but I want to be able to build my application without having to think about what the network structure is that I'm going to deploy it on later. So think about this in terms of your own domain to see an example in your head. Think about how you might separate your reads from your writes, and think about how you might shard your domain instances for different domain instances that are within your overall domain. So here we're only talking about auctions. You might have auctions, customers, products, right? These are all domain instances that you may shard differently across the cluster. But think about how, what would you use as an identifier that would give you a highly distributed hash key for those? It's actually very analogous to the same kind of thinking you would do if you were going to use cluster sharding, let's say, in MongoDB. So database cluster sharding. It's the same principle, except in this case, we're talking about actor cluster sharding. So we're saying an actor is going to wrap that state. How would we distribute it across the network? So a customer ID might actually be a really bad idea, particularly if that's a sequential number, because the next 10,000 of them are all going to start with one. So that, for instance, wouldn't be a good idea. I've seen people do things as crazy as use the reverse of a timestamp you know, to actually get an even distribution. Uh, but often, if you think about your domain, there's a good cluster key. And one of the magical steps in this process in applying this model is picking that good cluster key for each of the domain objects. The deployment structure is critical to get all the benefits safely. So the application model is very simple. However, you're deploying it onto a cluster shard at Acre cluster, which is, takes a little bit to get set up correctly and to understand exactly how to tune it. So here's these example applications I've been talking about all along. We're going to talk about online auctions. Two implementations. Users place bids for auctions. So there's an auction, you want to buy a widget. Various users across the network are going to place bids in an attempt to place the highest value on this auction before it closes and grab that item. Simple enough, right? The vast majority of the code between the two versions here is actually shared. 
So there's actually only about, I think it worked out to something like 250 lines of code that's different between the two implementations. The APIs, so in this case it's exposing a REST API, just for simplicity's sake, are actually exactly the same. So the REST calls that are made, exactly the same. The outside world doesn't need to know that you've applied this model internally. And it's an identical deploy structure. We actually deployed, when we did this test, we did it on AWS and we deployed it on a series of machines and then we shut that version down, deployed the DDD, D, triple D version on the same machines, on exactly the same instances on the hardware. They were actually not very large machines, if I recall. The exact spec is on the GitHub repo. <clears throat> and one of these is using the CRUD model, basically doing updates and deletes directly uh, in one spot, and the other one is using a distributed domain-driven design model. So the, the CRUD version still uses ACA. So this is a pattern that is actually specifically nothing to do with ACA. It's just that it fits very nicely on top of ACA, but you can do CRUD perfectly well in ACA as well. And the non-DDDD version of this application is in fact using ACA as well. Receives a request, writes directly to the Cassandra data store. It's actually a cluster of three different Cassandra nodes on the back end. And it looks a little bit like this. Now I'm not gonna sit here and try to read this code to you. It's not all that readable, I'm sure, on the board. Um, but I trust that you all know where GitHub is and can find it and have a look at it. What I really want you to get a feel for is that it's not a whole lot of code. You know, this is the, this is the primary actor that's actually doing the work. This should be extremely familiar to Katrin wherever she is. She wrote it. So, <clears throat> let's see. So what, what are we going to do differently? What's the code gonna look like for the other version? So in this case, we're going to be using in-memory state, although it is not volatile is the term I was looking for. Thank you for letting me think about that for a minute. E.g., it's in-memory state, but if the node that that in-memory state is on happens to die, I would recover that state from a persistent journal out of Cassandra. So it's not like I'm just writing everything into an in-memory database and hoping the lights don't go, don't go out. This is still a completely consistent model. You can shut everything down, start it back up. You'll start from the same state you were. We rec oh, I say that. Recover state from journal on startup. Um, uses become. Now, if you're familiar with actors and the actor model, the, one of the things you can do with actors very easily is to implement a finite state machine. And you do that by saying this particular actor receives messages and handles it with this chunk of code. But after a certain situation happens, let's say I receive a message that tells me to, I can actually replace that chunk of code with some other chunk of code. And the way we do that is by using become. Well, now I've transitioned into essentially a whole new actor. The shell's the same, but the insides are different, that responds in a different fashion. This is a very easy way to implement a finite state machine because each of those transitions, each of those becomes, is a state transition. And each of these actors passivate given a timeout. So they actually send themselves a message, in essence, that says, if I received this message and I haven't gotten anything else since the last time I saw this message, it's time to shut down. I actually become passive and come out of the network. From the outside, nothing appears to change. Because if I attempt to access that actor, I say, give me auction one, two, three, four again, it will simply rehydrate itself and become available with a very slight delay as it reads the journal. And then it's highly available, it's in memory, receives all of the other messages for that auction, and then passivates again when nothing happens. So, this actually takes two screens, <laughs> but here is the, here's the code for the DDDD version of that same actor. Now, a lot of the classes and names, if you read through this carefully, are actually exactly the same, and you'll see that there's a receive command here called initial. So we're saying initially my state is the one defined here with initial, and then when context changes, I can actually swap out into a different state. So that's the finite state machine part. There's nothing about finite state machines in ACA or the become that is necessarily tied to DDDD. It's just an easy way to do it. And here's the other page. So as you can see, there's a little bit more code. And if you dig through here somewhere, you'll find the timeout and you'll see the passivate command being used. And we're also using ACA persistence. ACA persistence is a mechanism that says, when I receive a message as an actor, I first write it to a journal then I mutate my state based on what that message says. The order is very important because if the lights go out after I've written it to the journal, then when I come back up, everything I've written to the journal will then reprocess and affect my state and I'll be in exactly the same state as I was before the lights went out. So if this actor crashes due to an exception or a failure, out of memory, whatever, the lights go out on that node, I restore myself to exactly the state where I last wrote the log. 
And therefore, I continue processing from the next message in exactly the same point. Oh, uh, yes, one last little piece of code. So two and a half screens of code for the dom distributed domain-driven design version. So let's look at the results of actually running that. So without sitting here and actually watch, letting you watch uh, numbers go by, I'll show you the answer immediately. We, as I said, deployed this on AWS, three Cassandra nodes, three ACA processing nodes, one front end, because it turned out the HTTP part wasn't the bottleneck at all. That was easy. So we just had one front end that was actually routing the request to the ACA cluster. Uh, that's right, they were all small AWS instances. And we fired up 100 simultaneous users. I'll show you the simulation for that in a moment. And we had 100 auctions, and we let that run for two minutes. So over a period of two minutes, we ran this application. Here's the simulation. This is actually using uh, Gatling, which is a really nice load testing tool for Scala that allows you to define a simulation for HTTP that says ramp up to this many users doing these operations and keep that load continuous or ramp it in certain directions over the following period of time and then ramp back down. So it allows you to easily build a quick and dirty simulation. And then record all of the responses. So how long did each of those HTTP requests take? What was the latency? What was the response time? And so forth. So really all of the magic happens right here on this line. We say, at once, one user, nothing for four seconds, then nothing for four seconds, add all at once 100 users, and then run this simulation. So that's much like uh, ACA streams. You first define, and then you say, go, at the bottom. So that's what Gatling would look like. So let's look at a few of the nice graphs and charts that Gatling gives us if we run it against our two different applications. This is the, when I say the CRUD version, I'm talking about the non-distributed domain-driven design version. And when I say CQRS, I'm talking about the one using distri uh, distributed domain-driven design. Something I will point out is that the scale is different between these two graphs. Don't be deceived. What's really interesting is the shape of the response times is very different between the two of them. And typically what you see with a, a distributed domain-driven design application is that startup isn't a whole lot faster than any other version because you're in fact reading those journals and spinning up all of the instances. If you actually randomly ask for all 100 auctions, then after a few milliseconds, all 100 auctions will be in memory, and then your response time will get dramatically better because you're essentially running an in-memory application, except for the journaling. So the journaling for the change in state for each of those auctions is what we're writing to disk, what we're writing to the Cassandra cluster. So as you can see, we immediately got a boost in performance and we also got a very different shape on our response curves. Now, if we look at the response time percentiles, this also reads, gives you some interesting information, not only in the absolute numbers, but also in the shape of the curve. So again, startup time, you kind of have to discount. And there was an interesting spike here. We, we think that it was actually a, um, a replication going on between two of the Cassandra clusters. We tried to figure out what that is. It's quite consistent. When we run it time and again, we get this interesting spike after about a minute. And we get somewhere in the order of, it looks like about 2,000 requests, somewhere in that order. Two, sorry, 2,000 milliseconds max for the number of requests over our full two-minute period. So this, was our, this is over our two minutes. Now, the scale is again very different here in the sense that our response times were significantly better, about half, even in the worst case. And they actually got, as we loaded all of our instances into memory, so as we activated all of our actors, we of course got extremely low response times after that happened. And those response times remain low. In fact, in some cases, got a little better over time as caches filled and so forth. So although the scale is different, and then the number of requests per second that we could handle over that two minute period. Now, of course, as we go, the number of requests per second now, obviously this is that dent that we saw uh, in terms of the response times going up. This is exactly that same dent in the opposite direction if we look at response times across time like that. So the number of requests that we've handled were, you know, somewhere in about the, well, I guess 800 was about the max at about this peak here for the CQRS version. For the DDD version, again, the shape is very different, not just the level of performance we're getting, because we are getting better performance. It almost peaks in the 2700, 2800, somewhere like that scale. So even without adding any additional resources, we're already getting a very different response curve. 
Roughly, it comes out like this. If you want to boil all of that down, if you want to do a map reduce across that and bring it all into one number, within that period of two minutes, our CRUD version of our application could handle roughly 75, well, 76,000 requests, and our CQS version of about 200,000 requests. That's not altogether unexpected because essentially one is much more in memory than the other, although the writes are still happening. So we still have our consistency. What gets much more interesting is as we scale. Now if we say, let's add more nodes, because was those were on the same three nodes, right? That same configuration that we showed the first time. So what happens with the CRUD version and what happens with the CQRS version as we start throwing hardware at this? And we add nodes in our AWS cluster. In the CRUD version, contention goes up. Right? We're actually making the problem to some degree worse in the sense that the contention for any given auction will increase. The number of reads and writes queued to talk to that auction will go up. We'll actually get, fairly quickly, a diminishing benefit. In other words, uh, our, our uh, return on investment, if you like, for adding new nodes will rapidly go down as we add new nodes beyond a certain point. And tuning doesn't help much. We played with this, we played with cache size, we played with, and once you hit an optimum, you can twiddle all you want. It doesn't actually get a whole lot faster. With the CQRS version, for starters, we start reducing contention because, of course, the journals for each individual cluster shard are independent. So there is no one database. Now, as it turns out in production, what you do in order to uh, avoid having a single point of failure is you still have a three-node cluster of Cassandra behind each shard, but then you replicate that one cluster, that one journal, onto two other nodes, so that each node is in fact in three, each node actually has its data spread across three different, each cluster shard has its data spread across three different nodes. That way three different nodes have to go down before you actually lose data, right? So you still have to do some, that's what I mean by there's a little more setup on the back end to get this configured correctly, but then you're at the point where those three groups of Cassandra clusters don't know about each other at all. They're not related, so there's no single database point of contention, and you can keep scaling that up. So, no contention. Near linear benefit until, and at first we went, what's going on? And then we realized what would make sense. Until we actually hit a number of nodes, which is equal to the number of auctions. Because what we're saying is then we're spinning up one node, one auction on each node. Well, adding more nodes, they're idle. <laughs> they're not doing anything, because there's no actors to be spun up on them. Right, so if you only had 100 elements, this is going to cap out around 100 nodes. If you have 15 million customers, on the other hand, it'll take all the nodes you can afford, essentially. Right? You're not going to run out of it. Unless, of course, you get to 15 million nodes. Yeah. Is that what brought AWS down the other day? Um, and tuning is incredibly important. It makes a huge difference. For example, getting the right speed uh, up to snuff by setting all of the correct parameters for the Cassandra clusters was very important. When we first did this experiment, we thought, uh-oh, we've disproved our theory, because it actually turned out the distributed domain-driven design one was terribly slow. And we're like, wow, okay, so much for that demo, we're not going to do that talk. Um, and then we tuned it correctly. <clears throat> and it turned out that tuning makes a huge difference for the distributed version. Read into that what you may. So here's, here's the money graph. <laughs> and what we're saying is, how many requests could we handle in two minutes based on how many nodes do we have? So if we start throwing hardware at the problem, we're starting to move to the right. And here is, in essence, our scalability, because these are the number of requests we managed to handle in those two minutes. And what we saw is pretty much what we expected, with a few little lurchers that we can't quite explain. But that's how true experiments go. Um, what we found is, initially, we were doing a little better right away than the CRUD version. The CRUD version, after we got about eh, somewhere in the 10, 12, it was really hard to tell. We had to do this many times and run an average. But after we got sort of in the 10, 12 nodes region, we started to cap out on what the value of additional nodes. And then if you get up to 30 or 40, it actually starts to go down <laughs> because the cross cluster communication and coordination between the um, Cassandra nodes and the ACA cluster is actually exceeding the network traffic of the actual HTTP requests. So we went down a little bit here. With the CQRS DDD version, we got exactly what we expected, and that is a near linear, with a few odd glitches, like I said, um, increase in the number of requests we could handle within a two minute period. So we're taking out any uh, variability by startup time and shutdown time. We're trying to take that out of the equation by letting it cook for a full two minutes. And then all of a sudden, we hit a, an absolute plateau when we get exactly to, well, not quite, but nearly to one node 
per auction. We reached the point of diminishing returns. What we didn't try, and certainly you could, and please send us a graph if you do, is uh, what happens if you crank that up to 1,000 auctions? then theoretically, you would have a lower curve because the number of requests would be a little lower, but it would be linear far past 100. So throwing new resources at it should actually give you about the same increase for every new node way out to 1,000 servers. We couldn't afford that much AWS time. Actually, I think we hit a limit on our AWS and it said, you can't have any more servers, go away. <laughs> so, so that's what we got. Here it is. Here's the activator template. If you want to go find this, I'll, of course, have these slides available afterwards. Um, Akadddd 4 ds template. <clears throat> and try plugging in your domain. Try changing the uh, object that we're actually doing this on, which in this case is the auction. We're not distributing the users. We're actually just distributing one domain instance, and it's the auctions. Try doing this with your own domain and see if you can figure out how to separate your read and write operations so that they're two separate things. And that's what we did. Any questions to that? <laughs>